Hey, everybody. Welcome back to Reason and Theology. I have a treat for you. Um, well, it's either a treat or it will be torture, one of the two. Uh, <laughs> there, <laughs> there was a video that I just came across uh, earlier today uh, where it's a debate between uh, Cardinal Pell, who at the time wasn't a cardinal. He was a bishop of Melbourne. Mm -hmm. Um, and he was debating a Jesuit on the question of contraception. And what I found interesting was some of the comments from the audience, namely the Susans from the parish councils uh, in the audience, which I thought, wow. First of all, my initial thought was, how many parish councils have they terrorized? <laughs> that was my number one question. And then, and then number two, uh, my, my other question was, can I get somebody here to be present with me? Because I think if I watch this, you know, alone, I, I might have a heart attack. So I need to have somebody here with me as I watch this thing. If you see me fall out and pass out, you know, ca call the ambulance for me. <laughs> We're going to watch it together. I only saw a few minutes of this. So this is mostly a first impression review. I'm not going to watch the entire video. I think it's 34 minutes. I put a link to it in the description. I'm not going to watch the whole thing, but we'll watch, I guess, some snippets. I started around the eight minute mark and I, I tapped out at like the 13 minute mark or so. <laughs> I just said, I can't do this anymore. I, I need, I need some support here with me. <laughs> It's it, it will certainly make your blood boil. And I was so impressed by Cardinal Pell. I was just thinking, wow, he has a lot of patience because I would have overturned a few chairs <laughs> if I were there. Um, <clears throat> but we'll, we will review some of the um, some of the arguments that they use for um, contraception and against humane vitae. They, they of course touch on the issue of the magisterium, which is right up my alley. And that's when I really perked up and I thought, oh, wow, this is really, really interesting. Um, somebody asked, is this a comedy hour? It, it might as well be. It, it might as well be. Okay. Like I said, I'm just kind of randomly jumping into eight minutes, 27 seconds. I didn't see the beginning. Like I said, I haven't seen most of this. We're gonna do it together. We're, we're gonna we're gonna try to get through this together, y'all. We're we're stronger when we're together. So, okay. Let's see. Cardinal Pell versus Susan from the Parish Council on some TV show, I guess, in Australia from back in the day. Okay. Uh, where is the play button? There it is. By the way, can y'all hear that? Let me know. Let me know now. Did y'all just hear that? They said something about priests and nuns. I want to make sure that I'm getting audio in the chat. Uh, let's see. Somebody said, wow, this is old. Believe it or not, this is from 1993. I thought maybe this was filmed in the 70s. Somebody said, no, they can't hear it. Okay. Glad I asked. Let me try it again. What about now? Let me try now. Who, who don't apparently toe the line as you say they should. All right. Did you hear that? Who don't apparently toe the line as you say they should was what the gentleman said. Let me know in the chat. I don't want to review this thing while they're on mute for you. Okay. Looks like y'all can hear it. All right. Let's move forward. Well, I, I would suggest to those priests and nuns that we don't debate it on television. In the first instance, uh, as we usually do in Australia, we talk about it privately. If there are significant policy or doctrinal differences, there are fora for discussing uh, uh, those. We don't immediately uh, go public. It's precisely that that the Pope is trying uh, to change. Well, uh, I would wonder whose church... Oh, and she's a sister. It's not just Susan. It's Sister Susan from the Parish Council. Okay. I belong to. It seems to me that uh, the Roman Catholic Church... Did you hear that, though? She wonders which Catholic Church she belongs to in this issue. Let me play that again so you can hear it. ...we don't immediately uh, go public. It's precisely that that the Pope is trying uh, to change. Well, uh, 
I would wonder whose church I belong to. It seems to me that uh, the Roman Catholic Church to which I belong does not just belong to the papacy or to bishops. It is the people of God, and I do believe that the, the people of God also have things to say before God and in the light of our tradition. Rhetoric. False dichotomy. Empty rhetoric. It's a both and. The learning church and the teaching church are not opposed to each other. They go hand in hand. They just have different functions. And yes, we can say that the laity do have an ability to express their concerns and, and, and their views to the magisterium. And the magisterium is to listen. They are to hear those things. But at the end of the day, it is the magisterium who is going to authoritatively rule, not the laity. And if you don't believe that, you ask, you know, somebody might ask at this point, well, what Catholic church do I belong to? Not the one established by Christ. You, you belong to a church you've made up in your own mind. The one established by Christ in sacred scripture has a teaching authority, and the listening church is to learn from the teaching authority. Yes, again, we can say, look, there's an extent to where the teaching authority can learn from the faithful. There's a very qualified sense in which we can say that, but it is ultimately the teaching church and the magisterium that is then going to authoritatively rule. And once that authoritative judgment is issued, it is for the learning church to do just that, to learn. It is for the laity and faithful to learn from that teaching authority. Otherwise, again, we don't belong to the historical Catholic Church that goes back to Jesus Christ and the establishment of the apostles, because we now no longer believe that Christ established a visibly identifiable institutional church with apostles and successors to the apostles who can teach, sanctify, and govern. We no longer believe that. If you no longer believe that, you're not a Catholic. So she asked the question, to what Catholic church does she belong? Exactly. That's the question that I would have for her. Is, is... There's, there's no dispute about that between, uh, I think it's Sister Veronica Brady. and myself uh, and the Pope. That's not the issue. The issue is so where are the parameters of moral teaching, and if there's a dispute, uh, who has the last word on what is the Catholic? I gotta say, Cardinal Pell was rocking that hair. I mean, it was it's, it's looking good, but I did think that this was filmed in the '70s specifically because of the hairstyle. But no, I looked it up. It's it's 1993. Like teaching, how people are able to live that out in their own lives. Uh, uh, that they have to answer for that uh, before God. I find it very difficult to square in my unfortunate conscience that um, the teaching authority of the church does not also have to listen to the experience of the people who live out these problems. And in, in fact, the teaching authority does. This is what Donum Veritatis notes very well. I know it had not been issued at this time, but Donum Veritatis does really well of navigating between the concerns that um, Sister Susan is offering. I don't remember her first name, so we're going to call her Sister Susan from the parish council. Um, it actually does a really good job between navigating with the traditional teaching that the magisterium authoritatively teaches the faithful, but also the magisterium is willing to listen and take into account what the faithful are saying in a, in a qualified sense. It does a really good job at balancing those two things out, which it, it, I, I would say it does take into account her concern here. But my concern is she appeals to her conscience. And ultimately, one's conscience has to yield to the magisterium and the teaching authority of the church. If I were to stand in front of Jesus, Jesus, you know, 2,000 years ago, Jesus is preaching, and I just say, Jesus, in my conscience, you know, I don't really agree with you on this. No, I would not have had the ability to do that. No, my conscience would need to conform to whatever he is teaching. Likewise, if Jesus has, in fact, given us a magisterium that is able to authoritatively teach on his behalf, then if we are rejecting the magisterium upon basis, the basis of our conscience, it's no different than just saying, you know what, Jesus, I reject you and what you're teaching. 
uh, upon grounds of my conscience will let me assent to what you're saying. No, it's it's the other way around. You inform your conscience based on the authority. The authority does not inform itself based on your conscience. I mean, can you imagine the chaos that we would have if the magisterium literally just said, okay, well, all right, what does your conscience say? Okay, what does your conscience say? What And what does your conscience say? It, it just completely changes its teachings to line up with what every other individual is saying? Or worse is one saying that there is no teaching authority and it's ultimately up to the individual's conscience to determine. At that point, you've left Catholicism and you've left the historical institution that Christ has established. And at this point, you've moved over into a form of Protestantism. I don't think all Protestants would agree with, with that particular view. I'm just saying a form of Protestantism, especially one that would, would not really even have a visible institution and a visible teaching authority. Um, so I, I would simply, in, again, reiterate that what I'm hearing from Sister Susan here does not sound Catholic at all. And I can only imagine how <laughs> how frustrated some people were when they were dealing with this, you know, from the time that Humane Vitae was issued until, I mean, evidently a still raging debate in the 90s. Um, I could only imagine how frustrated some people would be and how tempting it would be to cling to every form of tradition to try to combat this liberal nonsense that we're hearing here. I can imagine that there would be a strong tendency to do that. Um, and I think that strong tendency has kind of won out. And now we're kind of facing the other problem where now there's such a clenching of the fist, if you will. And we're trying to maintain tradition so tightly that we're now starting to confuse ecclesial traditions, which can change with sacred tradition itself. We're kind of going to the opposite problem of Sister Susan from the parish council and religious community here. Um, but again, that being said, I am sympathetic to the people who kind of clinch their fist to an extent because it's like, yeah, I get it. Especially if you had lived during this context and fought all those battles. I get it. It doesn't excuse kind of going to that extreme, but I see how this happened. I see how we ended up where we are right now, basically. I find it very strange that the encyclical seems to set aside several hundred years of careful thinking on moral matters. So Humane Vitae is setting aside several hundred years of careful thinking. Couldn't somebody just turn that right back around and say, well, if you're rejecting the church's teaching here, and in fact, the teaching authority behind this teaching, aren't you setting aside 2,000 years of teaching and tradition and witness of the faithful? In people's consciences, I, it, this just could easily be turned right back around on, on Sister Susan here. Seems to be um, out of touch, if you like, with contemporary thinking. It, it does seem to me that the, the tradition of the church has always been that God speaks to us within our culture and not necessarily from on high. Contemporary thinking. But place yourself in, I don't know, uh, 1000 BC. What, what was contemporary thinking at that time? Well, contemporary thinking was that there are many gods and that we are to worship idols. And yet the people of God in that very instance were counter-cultural, saying, no, there's one God and we don't worship idols. I think that this is empty rhetoric when people start appealing to the culture and the way that modern society sees things, okay, but cultures can be wrong. Cultures can think that you can eliminate, some cultures have thought that you can eliminate an entire group of people just based on their genetics. It's, it's absurd to appeal to contemporary thinking as if that somehow trumps the magisterium and the teaching authority of Christ. Certainly, we want to hear what contemporary man has to say in every age. We certainly want to hear. We, we need to hear what is being said. Sometimes there are good things that are being said. 
However, in a lot of cases, there's a lot of bad being said, and that has to be filtered out by the magisterium. What the magisterium has done is it takes the good from society and filters out the bad. All throughout church history, we have taken some good things from paganism and baptized them and then discarded the evil things. Over and over and over in church history, we've done that. The magisterium has carefully guarded the deposit of faith by doing that. And this isn't even just the New, new Covenant people. The Old Covenant did the same thing. There were some things that they did borrow from the pagans, but they filtered them out. They, fil uh, they filtered out the evil things and kept the good. So I'm not saying that we're, we're to just completely ignore everything in society and society can't offer anything. No, 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 no. There's some good, but then there's a lot of bad. And it's ultimately going to be up to the teaching authority of the church to be able to filter those things out, not our individual conscience. Do you see this as the opportunity to, uh, to draw the line in the sand, if you like, against the drift that has been happening within the church? Uh, uh, yes, and so does the Pope. The Pope says there's a crisis. He says that this orchestrated and public dissent about basic Catholic teachings is doing uh, great damage, is causing great confusion. Uh, and I've seen this with our Catholic youngsters. Uh, often they really don't know what the church is teaching. Boom! Mic drop. Yep. Absolutely. This, this kind of dissent harms the church. And it was even coming from younger people at this time. Likewise, today, it's, it's really no different. We still have plenty of dissent today not only from the left, but sometimes from extreme right. And sometimes it's also, again, from the youth. So it seems like we're li living in kind of similar times, but maybe just the pendulum has swung to the other end in some quarters, not all, but in some. But we're dealing with the same problems, ultimately, and that is they share something in common, that is dissent against the magisterium. At this time, dissent was especially coming from the left. Right now, we can say a lot of dissent is starting to come from the extreme right. But in both cases, it's two sides to the same coin. That is the dissenting coin. And uh, I think we have they have a, a right to hear from us what is genuine Catholic teaching, and then they will make up their own minds. Well, I'd like to go on to this issue. You said you were going to draw draw the line in the sand, if you like, about the, the drift towards liberalism in the church. There is a counter-argument, I guess, and that is that, uh, that liberal teachings very much have failed uh, in, in recent years, that we now have more family breakdowns, Father Uren. That in <laughs> and so, some would actually seriously suggest that, oh no, it's because the church did not liberalize itself even more. That's why it's failed. No. No. No, that's, that's not it. That's not it at all. <laughs> If we became more like the world even more, we would reach less people, certainly. Moreover, you have in sacred scripture over and over, we are to be a peculiar people. We are to be called out ones. That's what the term holy means. We're to be a holy nation, a holy people. We're to be called out from the world. Yes, we live in the world. And yes, we could take some good from the world. Absolutely. But we're to be called out. That is set apart. That is, we are not going to embrace the evil in the world. And we're not going to incorporate the, the evil that is in society into the church. We're to be called out from it. In fact, people are crying out for a, a moral beacon, a clear framework, if you like. Well, I mean, people often do point back to the Second Vatican Council as a watershed. So his name is Father Bill Uren, Australian Jesuit leader. So that's the guy debating him. I didn't find him as fascinating as Susan here. This type of discussion. And obviously there have been uh, a considerable breakdown in a variety of areas, family areas and other uh, areas um, in which the church has spoken hitherto very authoritatively. But I think to trace that back exclusively... It's a boss move when you use the term hitherto. <laughs> I'm just saying. <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard somebody actually say that verbally. I usually just see it written. Okay, well, let's move on. <laughs> as it were, uh, a further discussion 
among members of the church to say this is responsible for the breakdown, I think is, uh, is an exaggeration. I think you've only got to look at the fact that because, say, the Catholic Church, particularly in Australia, has invested so heavily in education, it was only a matter of time before members of the church would not necessarily be satisfied with what they hear in sermons on Sunday, that they would try and integrate that with their wider cultural experience, draw upon a variety of uh, data that are available to people who go to secondary. Are y'all following any of this? I tuned out. I'm sorry. I, I zoned out. I, he, he lost my attention. I don't even know what he's saying right now. Schools in the first instance and then into tertiary education and that this authoritative mode, um, which admits, as it were, of no debate or precludes debate or says draws lines in the sand or says this is the last word, that that obviously is not going to wash. Can I just cut through a little if I can here? Clearly, rightly or wrongly, a lot of people who regard themselves as good Catholics do use contraception. Sister Hall, can I bring you in here and ask you how you feel? But how do we define ourselves as good Catholics? Is it ultimately based on my conscience or, or is there a teaching authority that I am to conform myself to? Again, if it's ultimately up to my conscience to determine whether or not I'm good, then what's even the point of Christianity altogether? Because if I can determine what is good, just individually in my conscience, I don't even need Christianity. I, I don't need Jesus. I don't need any kind of teacher. I can just determine things for myself. But at that point, I am throwing away not only the Catholic magisterium, I'm just throwing away Christianity altogether. But I honestly do think that that's the logical conclusion of what a person should embrace if they carry their views to their logical conclusion, which I'm not saying they should. I think that they should repent and turn the other way, but I'm just saying if they carry that to its logical conclusion, you're the ultimate arbiter of what is right or wrong. Why waste your time with Christianity? Don't you have other things that you could be doing with your life? Why, why worry about religion? I feel that, that those people who have been using contraception, they feel in good conscience will now feel that they're being told that uh, it's, it's akin to intrinsic evil. It's the same situation again. Um, it, the women's ex Okay, so here's Sister Anne Hall, sexual assault counselor. Okay. Experiences are not being listened to. Um, because of my work in a centre against sexual assault, I'm constantly hearing of stories of women being raped. I'm hearing stories of women who have been raped by fathers, by their... So here we go. Here's what you're you're probably about to see right now. It's what it sounds like. Let me take a stab at it. Sounds like she's about to go the direction of, well, you have people who are raped, therefore the use of contraception can't be intrinsically evil because what, do you really expect these people to carry the baby to term and to actually have the baby and stuff like that? So, you know, it's an argument for contraception and it can also be an argument for abortion. I wonder if that's where she's about to take it. Let's, let's see. contraception. Sister Hall, can I bring you in here and ask you how you feel that, that those people who have been using contraception, they feel in good conscience, will now feel that they're being told that uh, it's, it's akin to intrinsic evil? It's the same situation again. Um, it, the women's experiences are not being listened to. Um, because of my work in a, a centre against sexual assault, I'm constantly hearing of stories of women being raped. I'm hearing stories of women who have been raped by fathers, by their uncles, by their husbands in marriage, and there's no room for those women in this encyclical. What does that have to do with the morality of the use of contraception? I mean, I hate to hear of stories like that. Believe me, I hate to hear that. And my heart goes out to those people. But what does that have to do with justifying contraception? Nothing. It's just an emotional appeal. It's empty rhetoric. This is what they tend to do over and over and over. And I, I could be like, you know, there's people out there. You're just not listening to the idol worshipers and their experiences with idol worshiping. They, they have these experiences when they worship Baal. They, they have these prophetic utterances. What, what does that that doesn't somehow overturn anything that the magisterium has to say or that God has to say about idol worship. Likewise, any other question involving faith and morals, 
a person's individual experience doesn't overturn that teaching authority unless you don't believe that there is that teaching authority there that is authoritative. And that's what's behind all of this. All of this dissent from the left ultimately boils down to a lack of belief that there is an ultimate teaching authority that is able to coerce your conscience, that, that, that is able to uh, inform your conscience, that, that you are to assent to, and you are to conform your conscience to. It's ultimately, at the end of the day, it all boils down to a denial of that. And it's a real it's a real shame and a pain for these women that those issues are not being addressed, that their whole experience and the reality. <laughs> Look at this. <laughs> I, I, I won't say what it is for fear that you, YouTube will probably cancel me. But yeah, I don't think that they would have that symbol uh, in today's contemporary society. Right. <laughs> There's not enough symbols there for today. <laughs> of their lives is not being addressed, addressed in this encyclical. And so where do these women go? They're expecting leadership from the church. And again, they're being let down by a male dominated church. You hear the empty rhetoric by a male dominated church. Couldn't we use that argument against Jesus himself? Here you have a male who is coming and trying to tell us, you know, what it is that the father has to say. Couldn't we dismiss Jesus also for being a male? A male-dominated church. As if somehow that overturns truth. And if somehow, as if somehow that also means that Jesus did not establish a teaching authority that is excluded when it comes to this authoritative teaching category that is excluded to males. Why couldn't he do that? If God wanted to do that, why can't he do that? Upon what basis do we say that's unjust? This is just rhetoric again. They need leadership, and the leadership is coming from the laity in the church and from the religious. It is not coming from our bishops, and it is not coming from our pope. So again, it's it's a scandal. Bishop, it is often a perception. Of mm, the scandal is to think that leadership ultimately comes from the faithful. Now, there is a there is a certain sense in which you can have leadership from the faithful in certain roles but not as far as leadership as authoritative teachers. The only authoritative teachers that there are is the Pope and the College of Bishops. Those are the authoritative teachers, the ones who are able to bind the consciences of the faithful. Outside of that, you do have teachers, and you do have leaders, and you do have laity who are faithful, who are able to teach, but not in any kind of way that can bind the consciences of everyone else. I teach here on YouTube. But can I bind anyone's consciences to teachings that come from me? No, I cannot. However, the magisterium can. When the magisterium teaches, it can bind. Because we do believe that there is a teaching authority that goes back to Christ and in an institution established by Christ that is able to bind consciences. Um, so again, just it's just a false dichotomy. It's pitting the laity and the faithful against the magisterium. and at the end of the day, it's not a really well thought out position. But the Catholic Church, isn't it? That you have this problem of a sheltered celibate men ruling, if you like, on worldly issues, often affecting women. And so, you know, Jesus was um, celibate. I guess Jesus has nothing that he can say to society about celibacy and, uh, and also about the married life. I, I guess he has nothing he can say to women since he's a man. And he has nothing he can say about marriage since he was celibate. We're going to say, well, that's absurd. He's God, right? If you're Orthodox, you believe he's God. Well, of course, at that point, he has something to say. Okay. Well, guess what? If that same God, if that same Jesus established a teaching authority, then he can say of that teaching authority, he who hears you hears me. He who doesn't hear you does not hear me and the one who sent me. So if we reject the teaching authority that he established were effectively rejecting Helm. Uh, that is a, a perception, but I wonder with some of the things that have been said tonight uh, here already, whether in fact uh, the people making these claims about the encyclical have even cited it, let alone read it thoroughly. The encyclical is very pro-women. Oh. Oh. Look at that. <laughs> Look at that.
<laughs> that really set off Su Susan here. <laughs> she, she really got upset by that. Oh, let's see that reaction again. <laughs> Hold on. <laughs> Look at that face. <laughs> Oh boy. <laughs> if I had been there, I would have been in the background. Yeah. <laughs> go Bishop Pell. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Here we go. Uh, with some of the things that have been said tonight uh, here already, whether in fact uh, the people making these claims about the encyclical have even cited it, let alone read it thoroughly. The encyclical is very pro-women. Every, every, every... And the guy in the background, too, also gasped. <laughs> Sean says, that's how you trigger the Susans. Oh, yeah. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Turn it right back around on them. Yeah, they, they don't want to hear that. Again, I, I asked the question, how many parish councils have these Susans terrorized? That's the first question that came to mind i can only imagine god bless all of the priests that had to deal with them at the parish council <laughs> i'm just saying <laughs> i i don't envy them <laughs> one bit i know they had to deal with nightmares okay incidents that you laid out as objecting to would be explicitly and regularly condemned by the church and to the extent that any of us didn't do it we would be judged as failing against the standards of the uh, uh, of the encyclical bishop i just like to say on that that even the language of the encyclical mm -hmm. is non-inclusive mm -hmm. it does not include women they are not even named in that encyclical oh, it's not inclusive don't don't we hear this stuff today Right. Can't, can't we use this argument to really justify anything? The one thing you're anathematized for today in today's society is for being exclusive. And notice the euphemisms that they use. This is not inclusive. They don't use terms like, well, this is heresy. This is wrong. This is sinful. They don't use those terms. So they won't call something murder. They'll call it pro-choice. They use these nice little euphemisms to couch it and package it to where it sounds nice. But in reality, no, no, it's not. So l listen to the language that she uses. I imagine she would have been incredibly offended at Jesus. Jesus was very exclusive. No one comes to the Father except through me. <gasps> How dare you say that? You're not being inclusive enough. How dare you not name the Hindus? How dare you not include this or that? It, no, no one comes to the Father except through me. It's a very exclusive statement. So there are plenty of other exclusive statements in Jesus, by the way, and the New Testament and the Old Testament. At the end of the day, I'm left wondering, do people who use these kinds of arguments believe Scripture? Do they actually believe scripture? Probably not. Cool. That that's a cultural thing. The the oh. because the <laughs> did you hear it again? <laughs> Hold on, let's rewind. I heard I heard the guy again in the background. <laughs> Hold on, let's try it again. Bishop, I just like to say on that that even the language of the encyclical mm -hmm. is non-inclusive. It does not include women. They are not even named in that encyclical. That, that's a cultural thing. The, the, oh. Because oh. the encyclical is addressed not to men and women within the Catholic Church, not, even, not to people of goodwill. The encyclical is addressed to bishops. And the sort of argumentation that Father Uren is calling for has been left to people like himself and myself. And the Pope is saying, instead of denigrating Catholic teaching, get out and and correct some of the rampant misapprehensions about uh, what we stand for and explain the age-old gospel morality and respect for persons L listen to the ridiculousness of this argument ultimately so humane vitae cannot authoritatively judge on the goodness or evil of artificial contraception because it doesn't name women 
is that the argument that Sister Susan wants to really offer? Is, is that honestly the argument? So it doesn't have the authority to intervene on a matter of faith and morals definitively because it doesn't name a woman? Let, let's just carry that to its logical conclusion. I mean, there's a million applications that I could start to make here and say effectively that nothing could ever really be taught definitively. With such arbitrary <laughs> check marks that you have to tick off, that you have to, you know, check these things off, you know, it, it's so incredibly arbitrary that has nothing to do with whether or not there is a magisterium, whether it's authoritative, whether or not it can bond consciences, whether or not your conscience is bound to conform here, whether a woman is named or not is entirely irrelevant. I'd like to hear from some of the supporters of the encyclical on this. I just want to take up the point that there seems to be an attitude that somehow the church's teaching reinforced in this document about contraception is anti-woman and that women's views aren't being listened to on this question because I find that... Dang it! The only one who's in favor of the encyclical is named Susan. Are you kidding me? That ruins my entire thing here. Because now i got to call her Susan from the parish council too. And she's on the... She's on the good side. She's on the good team here. All right. We're, she's not Susan from the parish council. Um, she's Susan from Holy Hour. That's <laughs> All right. We're, we're calling her Susan from Holy Hour. Okay. Church is teaching on contraception as a woman. Fabulous. Because what it says is that you alone are not meant to bear the burden of contraception. This is something that takes place within your married relationship. Your husband bears equal responsibility with you. You're not the one who alone has to make decisions about... Um, condoms and all the condom meds are directed at women about pills or whatever and that as a woman we in the church accept you in the totality of your parts we're not saying to you turn off your fertility now we don't want to accept you as a mother we want to accept you as a worker or uh, this or that and i think in the church's teaching on contraception it's about the only body in the world today that recognizes me as a woman and recognizes that the way that my husband and i share our creative power in our marriage but it's more you Want to comment on this? I would have to say that women don't all share the view of this younger woman here, <laughs> that women who were affected by the Humani Vitae debate. Bernice. Ooh. <laughs> Bernice from the parish council. Okay. Women and the church is, I guess, the um, program she was with. Okay. You know, are still carrying the scars that they... In they, what way? Well, they either... They either went along in toto with what the church said or what they understood the church as saying, and they had as many children as they could have, and they still feel that that they were somehow denuded by that. Uh, they were denuded by having as many kids as they could? Gosh, it really sounds like she feels that children are a burden. I mean, I'm just kind of reading between the lines here. Um, happy as they are to see their children now grown up, they're also happy that their children have got a, a different, an entirely different attitude uh, to the birth control issue, which in fact people, I mean, we can shut the door on, the, on this argument really because people... Look at him so calm and patient. I just, I hats off to him. Let, let's pray for the repose of his soul. He recently passed away. Memory eternal. I, I, however, got to say I'm impressed by how patient and calm he is here. I'm, I'm telling you, I would have flipped over a chair or two already. <laughs> People have made their decision. Young women have made their decision on that, basically. The, the horse has bolted. Yeah, it has. Uh, over here, please. Yes, I, I think it'd be a great pity if we um, inadvertently led people to believe that this 180 pages is about contraception. You must have a look and see what it says about uh, political life. You must have a look and see what it says about those practices in business and commercial life, which are against human dignity. We'd have a very different kind of political and business life here in Australia if the things that are said to be against human dignity were actually accepted by people and lived out by people. Good to see you. Yes, if I could come in there. Firstly, uh, I think it's a little misleading of uh, Bishop Pell uh, and of uh, Bernadette Tobin to say that it's not a very significant document for the debate about contraception, particularly in Australia. 
because I understand what's happened here. Uh, there has been a bishop statement, I think, from about 1974, which essentially said that uh, people following their conscience were not to be condemned if, in mm -hmm. the light of their conscience, they decided that the use of contraception was acceptable for them. You know, bishop statements aren't magisterially authoritative unless they are um, confirmed by the Pope and his magisterium. Um, currently, they don't have teaching authority in their territories unless it's unanimous. Unless it's unanimous. If it's unanimous, then it does have authority in that territory. Um, but just kind of as a local or regional, or if you will now, I guess since we're talking about bishops' conferences national level. It seems to me that that is precisely one of the errors, so-called errors, which this encyclical is concerned to condemn. So if it's followed, it would seem to me a logical consequence that that bishop statement would have to be withdrawn and all those Catholics who have been told by their priests mm. that they are entitled in, in their light of their conscience to follow their own conscience and therefore to take the pill will now have to be condemned. And that is a disaster. If that, if that... It wouldn't necessarily be that they now have to be condemned. It means that those people need to repent. And now that they know better, they need to conform themselves to the image and likeness of Christ as they now hear a judgment from the shepherds that Christ has put into authority. That this is what it ultimately boils down to. Do you want to conform yourself to the image and likeness of Christ or to your own image and likeness? That happens. Um, and it seems to me that's a very reasonable reading of this document. If that happens, a lot of people are going to really be quite tortured. Some of them are perhaps going to leave the church. Some of them may uh, go on the field. But there were a lot of people who left Jesus whenever he spoke about the real presence in John 6. A lot of people said, they said, this is a hard saying. We can't do this. He says, I'll let you eat, eat my flesh, drink my blood. You have no life. Uh, no, this is a hard saying. We're out the door. Jesus didn't run after them and say, wait, look, let me change that teaching. No, it is what it is. You either conform yourself to the truth or you don't. But just because somebody leaves doesn't mean that that is a reason to change the message. If they leave because of the truth, so be it. That's on them. And we'll do everything that we can to win them over with the truth. We don't just completely discard them as if they mean nothing. No, no, no. It's not what I'm saying, but we don't change the message so that they come back. No, no. That's where the line is drawn in the sand, because truth doesn't change based on preferences. But the global results of that, uh, considering Catholics in, around the world in developing countries, seems to me to be disastrous. Could, could, I, could I have a little clarification about what, in fact, the 74 statement said? The 74 statement of the bishops said uh, quite a, a, a number of different and balancing things. One thing it did say was that if a person didn't follow the teaching of the church on contraception, there was no obligation for them to be excommunicated, to be driven from the church. And because of the comparative importance of the issue, I'm sure that today everybody would stand with that. But uh, it also made quite clear uh, in that statement that uh, people should uh, conform their consciences to the uh, to the official teaching which had been given uh, uh, by the Pope. If they decided to differ, one of the consequences that were, no one was going to try to apply was excommunication or to uh, remove them from the church. But the real... Uh, I don't know. I kind of feel like we need to... Start bringing back excommunications. I think we see where this has led us, where we just kind of let go excommunications. I know it's a last resort. I'm not saying it should be the first resort, but it is the last resort, and it's so rarely used these days. I think we need to have a comeback here. I don't know. I'm in favor of it. The point here is that this encyclical is dead in the water already. Why? Because, see, I'm a lawyer. And I know, as other lawyers here would know, is that if you don't have an enforcement system for law, you may as well throw it away. That's the international law experience, because there's no enforcement. You need enforcement. And the challenge to Bishop Pell... Well, what are you suggesting here? Moral police? <laughs> no. What, I, what I'm suggesting here is, is not enforcement in the bedrooms of Australia in relation to contraception. 
I'm, I'm ta talking here in terms of the teachers in the church who refuse to teach Christ's truth, that they can no longer be allowed with impunity to have this endless debate. That it doesn't matter how many encyclicals are put out, until Bishop Pell and his fellow bishops remove those persons, those dissidents, from, pe from places of authority and put ple people in those places, in seminaries, in schools, as their auxiliary bishops, as head of the Jesuits in Australia, and oh. there are loyal Catholics oh. in those positions, people will not. <laughs> oh, he, he is really going there. Good for hell. Good for hell. This is this is this is how how I would hopefully be if I were there. I, I would try to be this guy right here. I usually in these kinds of discussions, I'm the guy in the room that says the thing that none of the people want to hear. <laughs> I've been in this guy's situation before where I have the microphone, I say what needs to be said, and people have walked out, they've stormed out, ugh, and they're angry and they don't want it. I've been this guy before. It, it, takes, it takes some courage, so kudos to him. <laughs> Well, understand about, what the church's exactly teachings are and do them. And I, and I asked Bishop Pell, when will those people be removed and when will the people who actually dissent from what is an infallible teaching, humana vitae, yes, even Hans is, Kung says it is. The point you're making is... Mike, drop! <laughs> hold on, hold on. <laughs> you, you, did you hear all the people who freaked out when he said it's an infallible teaching? <laughs> I bet they did. <laughs> oh, oh, oh boy, I, got, I, I need to hear that again. Hold on. <laughs> okay, hold on. Come on. Head of the Jesuits in Australia, until there are loyal Catholics in those positions, people will not. <laughs> Well, understand what, what the church's exactly. teachings are and do them. And I, and I asked Bishop Pell, when will those people be removed and when will the people who actually dissent from what is an infallible teaching, humana vitae, yes, even Hans Kung, Kung says it is. The point you're making is a sad one for the last 25 years of this or so. <laughs> he pointed out, even Hans Kung said it's infallible. I'm pretty sure he did, yeah. I think he did say that. But that was, wasn't that one of the reasons why Hans Kung then went on to deny papal infallibility? Because he said, yeah, this is an instance of papal infallibility, and we know that this is wrong, therefore papal infallibility is false. Your life, there's been a generation growing up in that more liberal atmosphere. They're all out there in the schools now, in the, in the parishes now. How are you going to deal with that? Well, we've got to be careful not to crush the, uh, the weak reed to... Not too uh, carefully, uh, saying. Uh, Thank you, George. <laughs> Thank you, George. Um, <laughs> And the, the, the appeal of Christ, of course, was first of all to example and persuasion. Uh, for 300 years in the Roman Empire, we had no uh, force or anything like that. What the Pope is saying, though, is... Uh, you know, a comment here on persuasion, example and persuasion, that's not the only thing we see in the New Testament. What we also see in the New Testament is excommunication. It's right there in the New Testament. We do see that, and we see it in Jesus. Treat him as a tax collector. That's Jesus speaking about excommunication. Unfortunately, that's not being discussed here. Basically, uh, along those lines, that people in, a, in official positions on important issues should teach substantially what the church teaches. But if they now, don't. But, my well, parish priest but if they don't, when are you going to bring in church discipline? Don't just say, well, we're going to lead by example and persuade. That's not good enough. That might be good for a little while in certain cases, but there's going to come a time where when that doesn't work and enough problems are emerging from the dissent, you, you have to start employing more serious, more aggressive measures of discipline. Doesn't. When are you going to remove him? If he continues, will boom, he? boom. Hold on, let me. Let, I got my my boom sound effect. Hold on, hold on. Wait, wait. wait. Boom, Ooh. Ooh. bam, oh, bop, bada bop, boom, pow. Oh! Yes, yes, yes. I like this guy. Who is this guy? He said he's a lawyer. This guy should be a theologian. This guy should be a bishop. Hold on, let, let's hear it again.
Come on. Let's go. So, uh, there we go. Force or anything like that. What the Pope is saying, though, is uh, basically uh, along those lines that people in, a, in official positions on important issues should teach substantially what the church teaches. But if they now, don't. But my well, parish priest doesn't. When are you going to remove him? If he continues willfully, willfully and deliberately to teach, as he does in my parish, I won't mention it. Oh, wow. Contraception, in fact, oral contraception, artificial contraception is morally responsible and that it virtually is sin not to use it. When are you going to remove him? Well, I'm in the fortunate position as an auxiliary bishop. I can't remove anyone. Well, uh, when is Archbishop Little going to remove him or when is Bishop Heather going to remove him so that my children will be protected from false teaching? If these people want to have their opinion outside the church, that's freedom of speech. Yep, yep, yep. But from in the church, we should receive Catholic teaching. If someone makes a mistake once or twice, you forgive them, you, you counsel them, you talk to them. But when Somebody prays, uh, pray a rosary for this guy. I don't know if he's still around or not, but somebody pray a rosary for him. This, this, is, this is good. And they repeatedly do it for 25 years. We want them removed. We want to have shepherds, not hirelings. Morris West, we haven't heard from you. I'd like to, just simply to make my intervention in the form of two statements. The first is mine. The second is that of a great historian. In all cases... Who prefaces their words in person like that? This, this guy is certainly an author. <laughs> in the church, authority is conferred. This is my statement. In the church, in the case of the Pope, by election. In no case, however, is the power unlimited. <clears throat> Neither may it be used unjustly or in an arbitrary or despotic fashion. Ah. That is prohibited. Here we go with the rhetoric. Unjust, it's unlimited power, it's despotic. It can we say the same things about Jesus then? Jesus made very, very definitive and exclusive statements. Can't somebody just come and say, you know what, Jesus was, you know, a dictator and he was just saying this and that as if he has this unlimited power. Again, rhetoric. ...but by the moral law of which this encyclical speaks so strongly. When a person doesn't have a strong argument, they employ this kind of rhetoric. That's reality. When they can't actually offer a sufficient engagement theologically of a particular position, they resort to this kind of rhetoric. And the reason why is a lot of people will hear that rhetoric and be persuaded by it because that's good enough for the average person. So the acts done in the exercise of the magisterium by individuals or organizations are never beyond clarification, criticism, or when they merit it, outright condemnation. If this were not so, then as Lord Acton wrote in 1860, specters which it has taken... I have a feeling I know who wrote this. ...centuries of sorrowful effort to lay would come forth once more. The bulls which imposed a belief in the deposing power the bulls which prescribed the tortures and kindled the flames of the Inquisition, the bulls which erected witchcraft into a system. More rhetoric. Do you hear it? Rhetoric, rhetoric, rhetoric for days. This is what people who cannot engage theological issues do. And made the extermination of witches a frightful reality would become as venerable as the decrees of Nicaea, as incontrovertible as the writings of St. Luke. Thank Good you. Help. Of course, he doesn't name who said that, but it doesn't really matter anyway. Uh, and it's uh, uh, precisely, I th think, through the moral teaching of the New Testament, which this encyclical is reaffirming, that Morris West is able to condemn the things that he did. We're not appealing to uh, what the church has done as the norm. We're appealing to the teaching of Christ. And uh, the Pope is elected by the cardinals, but his authority comes not through his election. His authority comes from the power of the keys given to Peter by Christ, 
and he loses that power of the keys if he departs from the teaching of Christ. We can condemn these things because of the bases we have in uh, New Testament morality, and we stand judged by them as every other person does too. Which Again, you'll notice all of these dissenters don't believe in a magisterium, which effectively means they're heretics. Um, if you don't believe in the Catholic magisterium and you identify yourself as a Catholic and you have them, or you have ever even just been baptized, you are a heretic. If, if you're rejecting the magisterium, that there is no basis here for the magisterium, or the magisterium doesn't have the ability to buy my conscience on matters of faith and morals, you're a heretic. That's what it boils down to. And just be honest about it and say, hey, you know what? Catholicism isn't for me. Um, I'm going to go this other direction. Just just be honest and upfront with people and say that that's what it is. Don't, don't try to remain in the Catholic Church, identifying yourself as Catholic when you're already a heretic and you've already been automatically excommunicated. If, if there's any kind of intention here, or any kind of consent, any if there's a full willingness, there's an obstinacy behind this, you've been automatically excommunicated already. You're, you're not in good standing with the Catholic Church. You're not a Catholic anymore. Now, I'm not talking about people who are materially in heresy. No, those people are not. They taste the tensia, excommunicated. That's not what I'm referring to. I'm talking about people who are obstinate. Their, their will is there. Their consent is there. And, you know, I'm not specifically saying like any one of these people for sure that their consent was fully there. I don't know, but I'm just saying if, if for people who find themselves to be that person where they know, Hey, I don't believe this. I don't believe that there's a authority over me. I don't believe that there's a magisterium that it can behind my conscience. Just be honest and say, you know what? I'm not a Catholic anymore. Which brings us back to the point of what do you do with people who, who dis depart from that? And Veronica Brady, I know, wanted to say something on that. What disturbs and distresses me about... Uh, oh, it distresses her. Okay. Uh, some of the things that have been said this evening and also about the general tenor of the encyclical, it focuses all the time on what is evil and what is wrong. Oh, man. That's such a, such a terrible thing to do. To focus on what is wrong and to warn us about what is wrong. Gosh, you know what that reminds me of? Huh. Oh, yeah, sacred scripture. Like, over and over and over. 90% <laughs> of sacred scripture is about, hey, this is wrong, don't do it. <laughs> Where I ask you is the, the passion that the gospel gives us for humanity, for love, for life. Where does the gospel that condemns unrepentant sinners and speaks about them being cast into outer darkness where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth? That gospel? The encyclical speak about relational matters. It seems to me very individualistic in its view of morality. Where does it bring us where up before the great crisis facing God's creation, the great crisis of the environment? <laughs> Look at him there. <laughs> His face right now. <laughs> that, that's how I feel. That's how I feel when I when I have to listen to her. Where is the church? Where? I just this is it right here. That encapsulates my feeling. Hold on. Hold on. Let's let's listen to it one more time. of the encyclical, it focuses all the time on what is evil and what is wrong. Where, I ask you, is the, the passion that the gospel gives us for humanity... You heard somebody in the background, mm. When she said the passion for humanity, somebody went, mm. For love, for life. Where does the encyclical speak about relational matters? It seems to me very individualistic in its view of morality. Where does it bring us up before the great crisis facing God's creation, the great crisis of the environment, the great crisis of... Wait, is she saying that Humane Vitae has to address every single injustice ever, even though the vast majority of those things have already been covered elsewhere? It has to repeat a condemnation of every injustice ever? So it's like anytime you ever release an encyclical, you have to condemn everything that is possibly 
you know, conceivably evil. Is that the argument here? The population, the great crisis of violence, the, the idolatry of the economic system under which we live. Instead, we're focusing all the time on notions of evil and simply because this part of the Catholic tradition has so focused on sexuality, <clears throat> we, why are we giving the hope <clears throat> to the world? You know why? We had to address sexuality so much because the world addresses sexuality so much. So it becomes necessary to address problems related to sexuality so often because that's the number one problem in society. World that we as Christians have to give. Why we must be, be, be preoccupied all the time with what is sinful. May I? <laughs> <laughs> she, and she put her head into it. Did you see it? Hold on, let me rewind it. She said, why was, must we be preoccupied with what is sinful? And she just, you know. <laughs> Goodness. She would have hated Jesus. She would have hated Jesus if she had met him. If she just reads the Bible, I don't see how she doesn't hate Jesus, honestly. Because Jesus is constantly condemning sin. Yes, he's merciful. Yes, he's loving. Yes, he's forgiving. But he takes a very hard line against sin. And many of them were sexual sins, as does the rest of the New Testament. The great crisis of overpopulation, the great crisis of violence, the, the idolatry of the economic system under which we live. Instead, we're focusing all the time on notions of evil and simply because this part of the catholic tradition has so focused on sexuality <clears throat> we why are we giving the hope to the world that we as christians have to give why we must be be, be preoccupied all the time with what is sinful May I, Boom. Uh, are, you, are you obsessed with sin that's what this question is. Oh, uh, I, i'm certainly not and neither is the pope but I, I think there's no dispute amongst all honest catholics that uh, Many people within the church would be teaching uh, moral teachings, <coughs> which many of us here would object, and certainly the Pope would object to. I'm not naming names, but uh, that is a commonplace, and I've never heard anybody seriously dispute it. It's a major pastoral problem how we win the. She is livid! Oh, goodness! She is angry. This is getting under her skin. She she is personally convicted here in one way or another. She is <sighs> this is hitting a nerve. This is hitting a nerve. This is why parish councils go crazy. Because Susan from the parish council takes everything personally. Yeah. <laughs> Somebody says angry Susan in the chat. She's livid right now. Ascent of uh, Catholics generally to the moral teachings also in the area of sexuality which are contained in the New Testament and in the moral tradition of the church. We've got a gigantic task uh, on our hands and it's one that needs to be done. I mean the, the Pope is right in saying in the encyclical <clears throat> that there is a crisis in the church. He identifies it as a crisis of dissent. That is people don't agree with what I think. Um, dissent like people in this room? The real crisis, though, is the crisis of assent. Bah. And that is that the vast majority of Catholics in Australia have withdrawn their assent to being led by this Pope and most of these bishops. Yeah, that's a serious problem. Now, it's all very well for Bishop Pell to draw his line in the sand. But the fact is that for the vast majority of us, we don't care about his line in the sand. Bah. Again. <laughs> These are the same people who would have crucified Jesus if they had been alive at the time. Frankly, I'm just to be very blunt. They're the same people who would have crucified Christ. To be able to sit there and say, in reference to the teaching authority of Christ himself, that frankly, I don't care about the line being drawn. And I don't really care. You're saying, I don't care about Christ and what he has to teach. And if that's where you're at, you know what? If you were in the first century and you heard Jesus condemning some of your sins, you probably won't, would have wanted to have crucified him. Just saying. Um, we're not going to be excommunicated and we're not going to leave. It is our church. Um, no, 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 no. 
It's it's not. You you don't get to determine what Christ is going to do with his church. And he has put into place shepherds who are able to exclude wolves and excommunicate them so that they don't devour the sheep. Do you hear the haughtiness and arrogance behind that statement? We're here to stay. And what this encyclical wrongly identifies as a crisis of dissent is a crisis because we no longer have confidence that those who proclaim leadership are capable of exercising it. Wait, but having confidence in them to one extent or another is one thing. Assenting to their authoritative teachings is something else. If you don't have confidence in their authoritative teachings, you're not Catholic. This is not your church. Stop being dishonest and just say that. It's dishonest to continue to say, I'm Catholic, this is my church, but I completely reject something that is fundamental to this church. Sounding like theological civil war, Bishop. Uh, I've got no <laughs> doubt that the overwhelming majority of Catholic churchgoers and the overwhelming majority of people who call themselves Catholic would accept more than 90% of uh, the moral teaching in this encyclic. I have no doubt whatsoever uh, about that uh, at all. Now, I'd like to turn that argument back to the church. Um, anybody who knows the situation in the Vatican is aware that there's a particular coterie of theologians, moral theologians, who surround uh, the uh, congregation for the doctrine of the faith. They have a particular philosophical position, which is a very respectable position. But the people who are, as it were, condemned in the encyclical happen to be, at this time, their philosophical adversaries. Now, I think what the church needs to do, as individual consciences need to be well informed, I think the church needs to do exactly the same, to take account of a wider range of philosophical opinion, of gender opinion, um, of people's experience. And that means married people. That's what I think we tried to do at the Second Vatican Council when they set up the... And once we have taken those things into account, the magisterium can intervene though, right? And it can authoritatively teach though, right? See, that's what they don't want to accept. They want to say, yes, listen to everybody and all of their various opinions. But at the end of the day, don't issue any kind of definitive judgments because frankly, we don't recognize your authority. That's what effectively is being said here. The birth Control Commission that was referred to at the beginning got a wide range of people who had both expertise and experience. And they came up with significantly different conclusions. But because it didn't agree with what had been said previously, when I think we knew much less about the relational aspect of marriage, it was dismissed. Can we come back to the... <clears throat> Isn't this the same argument that people use against the New Testament when it comes to matters of same-sex unions? You see where this leads? Where does this end? Can't we just constantly say there's been a progress in our understanding, and so now we're going to discard X? When does it end? Practical application of how it affects Catholic families. Please, sir, you're a doctor, I know. I'm, I'm a doctor. I work um, in the area of pregnancy help and counsel and talk to a lot of Catholic couples. Um, they realize that the Pope is encouraging them by reinstating Humanae Vitae, is encouraging them to be generous in their family size. But if there is a serious reason for limiting their family size, encouraging the use of natural family planning. Now, in last month's British Medical Journal, there was a, a very large extensive survey on 20,000 women in India using natural family planning. And in avoiding a pregnancy, they had serious reasons in terms of poverty. In avoiding a pregnancy, it was 99% effective, which is as effective as the contraceptive pill in avoiding a pregnancy. All right, you mentioned India there, and I'd like to take the global picture up with Dr. Singer. Yes, thank you. I, as the doctor said, that the Pope is encouraging Catholics to have large families. I mean, I think that really ought to be enough when we look at the population of the world today and the environmental problems that Sister Brady mentioned. 
seems to me the height of irresponsibility for any religious leader, particularly a religious leader followed by people in Latin America or other. You, you hear what's being assumed here. The morality of an act gets to be determined by situations. It's called situational ethics, right? The developing countries to be encouraging people to have large families. And uh, as for the natural methods, the uh, so-called natural methods of, uh, of family planning, uh, as you said, we, we know that they do not work, whatever this particular study shows, that, that in the large long run they do not work, that they would require abstinence from sexual intercourse for long periods, which women are often powerless to actually bring about. Ooh, wait, huh? <laughs> Hold on, wait, what? <laughs> <laughs> the, the women are powerless to exercise self-restraint here is 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 that what i just heard did he just say that where are all the gasps from the feminists in the room right now <laughs> i didn't hear one gasp <laughs> let me hear that again maybe i misheard him of irresponsibility for any religious leader particularly a religious leader followed by people in Latin America or other developing countries to be encouraging people to have large families. And uh, as for the natural methods, uh, so-called natural <laughs> methods of, uh, of family planning, uh, as you said, we, we know that they do not work, whatever this particular study shows, that, that in the large long run they do not work, that they would require abstinence from sexual intercourse for long periods, which women are often powerless to actually bring about. And the feminist shook her head, yes! What? Um, I thought they're all about the empowerment of women. <laughs> but evidently they have no problem conceding a lack of self-restraint here. Okay. <sighs> and and uh, anyone who can say that it's favorable to women when they realize that power mm. situation of men and women, I think, is really a little naive. And uh, above all, um, it prevents uh, sterile. So he says, I think he's implying men pressure the women. Yeah, and they're just so powerless to resist them, right? Okay. ...which surely for couples who have completed their families is the most reliable, the most effective way. And uh, this document is reinforcing the teaching that says that must not be allowed. Peter Singer raised the issue of, of global uh, impact, I suppose, of, the, of this encyclical and Catholic teachings generally. And I think for non-Catholics, that is certainly a very relevant issue as I suspect it is for a lot of Catholics as well, not only in population terms, but in also the fight against AIDS, which of course came out since human I vita. I mean, developed as a, as a problem at the advent of AIDS since human I vita, and is also very much impacted on by uh, the teaching on, on contraception. What do these Catholic workers, carers do now who go into the field looking after AIDS patients? Are they to tell them, these infected people, not to use contraceptives? Um, uh, well, uh, I mean, obviously, because uh, what we're like the anti-smoking campaign. We say quit. We say that uh, the sex sexual activity is legitimate. With <laughs> now, now, Cardinal Pell, you know perfectly well the last thing they want to hear is self-restraint, because at the end of the day, that's what their problem is. They don't have restraint here in the area of sexuality. And that's what it boils down to. You know they don't want to hear that. Listen to the all the uh mm's. Listen. Vita and is also very much impacted on by uh, the teaching on, on contraception. What do these Catholic workers, carers do now who go into the field looking after AIDS patients? Are they to tell them, these infected people, not to use contraceptives? Um, uh, well, uh, I mean, obviously, because uh, what we're like the anti-smoking campaign. We say quit. We say that uh, the sex sexual activity is legitimate within uh, a heterosexual marriage. We've got no mandate to teach that it's uh, but, but anything. In Africa, but in Africa, there are parts of Africa where yeah. heterosexual AIDS is transmitted frequently, where the church has been in encouraging people not to use condoms in part of Uganda, for example there is five times the rate of spread of AIDS. And notice how they're using these 
exceptional situations, and by the way, I'm not justifying anything in any exceptional case. I'm just saying, notice how they always appeal to these exceptional cases and then apply it to themselves. And they know very well they're not in that exceptional case. Well, I, I uh, would be surprised if that was related to the uh, to the to the particular church uh, uh, teaching. That that's boom. An extreme case, but what we're uh, keen to do is to uh, to contain the spread of sexual irresponsibility, not just in the uh, related to AIDS, but right across the board. When Paul the Sixth, Pope, the Pope, put out uh, the encyclical on Humanae Vitae, said that the widespread use of the pill would bring about a deterioration of moral standards. We've seen that. Increased divorces, increased abortions, increased number of childless, uh, homeless children, increased number of uh, one-parent uh, families. We've, uh, the government has got a, a, an enormous bill in looking after all this, and this is related to the separation of sex from marriage. It's related to the irrespons the demand for instant uh, gratification and uh, the the flight from sexual responsibility encouraging people with the aids virus to continue having sexual intercourse using condoms is actually increasing the spread of aids because condoms have a 10 to 30 percent failure rate you're playing russian roulette with the lives of the other person involved in that sexual act because it is not an effective means of preventing the transmission of AIDS. Promoting the church's teaching, which enshrines the importance of Christian human sexuality within marriage and being faithful to partners and not promiscuous, will certainly help prevent the spread of AIDS. This is just the typical of the kind of morality that is completely oblivious to the way people really behave by trying to set a standard that it's impossible for people to comply to. It's impossible for them to comply to. I'm, let, let, let's end there. <laughs> Isn't that what this boils down to? It's impossible for them to comply to it. Basically, because they're not living aided by God's grace, it's impossible for their, them to comply. Well, yeah, if, if you're not aided by God's grace, uh, yeah, I, I agree. It is impossible. However, if you are walking in the Spirit, if you are conforming yourself to the image and likeness of Christ, if you're availing yourself of the sacraments, yeah, you know what? It's not impossible. Plenty of people have done it and are doing it, and certainly available to you if you want to do the right thing. All right, well, oh, I'm stopping there. I'm tapping out. I saw Sean Matthew in the chat. He said, Mike, I'm tapping out. Me, me too. Me too. Okay. <laughs> Kudos to Cardinal Bell for keeping his cool. Uh, wow. That was pretty impressive on his part, but also very disappointing to hear the dissenters. Um, ultimately, it boils down to, are we going to conform ourselves to the image and likeness of Christ or not? That's what this all boils down to. Well, anyways, I hope you all enjoyed this one. Hit the like button. Hit the subscribe button if you have. Be sure to put a comment there in the comment section as well. Share this on your social media. Of course, check me out, patreon.com forward slash reason of theology if you want to support me and get access to extra content. All right, see you later. Are you confused about how Catholic teaching authority works? With encyclicals, papal bulls, councils, and many other things, it's easy to get confused on what is authoritative and what is not. Fortunately, at MaximusInstitute.com, I have prepared a course explaining the magisterium from A to Z. Visit the website and check out the course Understanding the Magisterium for more information. If you're looking to buy or sell a home, office, or any kind of property anywhere in the world, you're going to want to call Real Estate for Life, and they're going to connect you with a Catholic agent. Now, that agent will donate a portion of their commission upon sale, and Real Estate for Life will donate 75% of that gift to a pro-life organization at no cost to you. Call Real Estate for Life at 1-877-LIFE-US1 or text them 248-431-1440. If you care about the pro-life cause, call them now. Is it possible 
that ancient aliens created other ancient aliens. Ancient alien theorists say yes, but then is it also possible that ancient aliens created the ancient alien theorists? And are the ancient aliens and ancient alien theorists led by the Vatican headed by the Pope? Ancient alien theorists and certain unnamed Catholic YouTubers say yes. Tired of Catholic shows that peddle conspiracy theories that sound like something out of an ancient aliens episode? Check out Reason and Theology for a more reasonable take.